good. Amen. Amen. I would encourage you to, uh, to practice those keys. They will unlock a number of doors. I, I get up in the morning and I say, good morning, Lord. I yield to you today. I just yield to you. And I receive from you gratefully just a fresh outpouring of your love. I, and, and there are times, many times during the day, I'll turn and do that. And I'll just greet him in surrender and greet him with gratitude for his love. And then we'll just tell him, Lord, I, I, I just choose to believe your word. I choose to believe it. You know, my, uh, Hebrews 4 says that uh, the hearing of the word did them no good because they didn't mix it with faith. Right? And so whenever we hear the word, we want to mix that word with faith and say, I believe that. I appropriate that. I make it mine. And then we will continuously be called on to give it away, to just be a source of blessing in season and out of season, when you feel like it and when you don't. By God's grace, his treasure is not dependent upon how we feel. So we just bless the Lord that he is taking us to a higher realm. Well, there are a number of things that I want to share with you, but I'll, I even have a topic, which is really most unusual that I have a title. Not that I have the topic, but I have the title, and I would like to give you the title Beyond Obedience. Beyond Obedience. And this is a word that the Lord dropped in my spirit a number of months ago. But first, I am primarily a teacher of the word. So is my husband. And in fact, we are doing every week now, uh, he does, he's one of the most phenomenal expositors of the scripture. I've known him since I've been 14, 12 years old. And uh, when I was converted at the age of 12, he was president of the youth group, he was 14, and he was teaching from Romans and Acts at 14. And I have known him for 49 years. We've been married 37. And I, I will just say to you that when the Holy Ghost got a hold of us, he gave us a passion for the scripture that has only increased. And we were talking, um, and I would like, I'm going to develop something, but I want you to turn with me to Luke 24, because um, in his case, he's uh, now going for his doctorate. And uh, so this year, this summer, he, besides everything else that's going on, he's been doing this in-depth studies. And I made a commitment, and ladies, I would like to challenge you with this. Uh, I've been on a number of uh, ordination councils for women, and I have been challenged by something. Usually I am one of a few women who are on these councils, uh, all the rest are, are pastors uh, from the area and women that are being commissioned into the ministry uh, after their training usually come into these councils and they're kind of interesting and we interact and we ask questions and uh, at one of these councils there was a uh, precious woman that came, a very godly, godly woman and I will never forget this experience. And they were interacting and asking different questions. And uh, when she left, they, uh, the brothers were discussing uh, her qualifications to be ordained. And one of the brothers said, uh, you know, she has a marvelous experience and uh, really knows the Lord. Um, but she really is a little biblically and theologically naive. And it was true. It was true. And I will tell you, I have a quest that we as women be biblically and theologically knowledgeable. That I, one of the reasons that Fuchsia has never had problems as she moves in and out of very interesting circles is because the gift and the work she has put into knowing the scripture and knowing various tenets of our faith, there isn't a thing that you can't discuss. She can discuss with any man uh, the, the issues of theology and the issues of biblical accuracy. And I personally have a passion, I will just tell you that, that I have a passion that as women in this generation, we be biblically literate and theologically aware. 
and I made a determination. I'm married to a man in the ministry. He is senior pastor, and I have made a determination that he would find me his equal in every sense of the word, that there wouldn't be an issue theologically or biblically that he could not discuss with me. And by God's grace, for these 37 years, we have plowed into this together. And I want to lay that challenge before you. Study to show yourself approved. A workman that does not need to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. And I would like, the, some of you, I've been with you in different places, and you have heard me share this because this is so alive. Luke chapter 24, there are, there are two things and this particular scripture opened up to me. I'm going to be sharing at the Bible school tomorrow morning. And uh, uh, so I'm really excited about that, except I want to be in two places at the same time. But I'm at the Bible school, and the assistant to Dr. Dr. Michael Brown um, is actually... I, I have considered him my spiritual son. I, Scott Volk, I have known him since he was nine years old. He grew up with my kids. And when I was down here uh, about two years ago, we were in Scott and Beth's home, and we were discussing various things, and we landed in our discussion in Luke 24. And something opened up to me in Luke chapter 24 that has really sharpened my perceptions. This is a workshop. And my passion is to somehow ignite within you a love for the truth. That you will be women who will move with a love and a passion for the truth of Jesus Christ and for his anointing. Now, Luke 24 gives us a good insight into this. When we were in Mexico, the Lord gave me another picture of an eagle. And say it with me from uh, Isaiah. They that wait, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as an eagle. They shall not and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Think of the eagle. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Let me see your eagle wings. Huh? Now, you know, an eagle doesn't flap. Right? Birds, little birds, flap. But an eagle does what? Soars. And an eagle soars. Uh, what, is, what, what does an eagle wait for before it can soar? The current of the wind. Now, one of the things the Lord spoke to me from uh, Luke 24 is that an eagle cannot soar with one wing. And neither can Christians. And there are two wings required to enable us to soar into the heavenlies. And they are found in Luke chapter 24 when Jesus was discussing with his disciples on the road to Emmaus. He made some observations. And you know, I won't go into all of it. Luke 24 is a marvelous section that unfolds for us. And in Luke chapter 24, um, where's my daughter? Oh, come here. Right, right up here, front table. You wanted me to mentor you. You're traveling with me. Get up here in the front row. Come on, come on. Well, uh, I had the last time I had, when I was here, uh, I had my two other daughters with me, the two older ones. And I just have to share this with you because this is really neat. And my Diana was uh, pregnant with uh, our grandson, who is now 14 months old. And we were in Pastor Kilpatrick's lounge and uh, Lois Gott and uh, Carol Arnott and uh, uh, Brenda Kilpatrick uh, went and laid hands upon her womb and literally Chase leapt in her womb. Diana said she will never forget that and Carol spoke over her womb and said may the sword of the Lord be put in this child's hand and uh, you know, I, and I, I just say that because I can also, you're going to hear leak out. I carry such a vision for what the Lord wants to do with our children and our grandchildren. Now, as we're looking at that, I will also tell you I do parenting seminars. I have a passion to see us as parents, as grandparents, be just 
imparting to these kids. The most important job I have is being a mother and a grandmother. I, I love that. And whatever else I do, I love what I do, but whatever else I do flows out of my, my whole love for what God is doing in the family. And I will lay out for you, some of you that are older sisters, I want to see you commissioned with an intercessory burden and with getting mobilized as Titus II women. Let the older women teach the younger women how to love their husbands how to love their children, how to love their families. Wounded people wound people. And we have a church full of wounded people. And what we're finding, even as we're doing some of these parenting seminars, is that parents love their kids, but they themselves are wounded and they don't mean to wound, just as many of us. We loved our children, but because they were unresolved issues in our own lives we inflicted pain upon our own kids but the Lord is saying I'm stopping that I am giving you a fresh baptism of the Holy Ghost not to simply thrill and chill you but I've come to give a fresh anointing of my love to heal the deepest recesses of your being to make you whole to to bring you into an awareness that I love you and I'm I'm breaking rejection in your life I'm breaking abandonment in your life that you can love unconditionally the families that I have given you and I feel that also those of you that are senior pastors wives or pastors wives that the Lord is giving us an anointing to love our people to love them to love our people and to be an example to our people so I, I let me just spill out to you today I just will overflow in a number of the different areas just hear that that's one of the things the Lord is doing he's raising up women to be nurturers that's part of the Deborah anointing uh, a family life ceased it's written in Judges until I Deborah arose a mother in Israel and it is my passion to just see us know how to nurture you know what I have to land here for a minute can I give you four A's how many of you are mothers how many of you are grandmothers uh huh. Look at how many of us grandmothers there are. Isn't that exciting? How many of you are pastor's wives? How many of you are Bible teachers? Yes. How many of you sense a Titus II call upon your life? Yes. I pray that it'll be all over this whole. Oh, I, I, I cannot tell you, I will not be content until women do awaken to who they are. And that more than anything, so that we become lovers, 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 lovers of the Lord and lovers of those that have been entrusted to us. You know, you may not be accustomed to uh, giving affection, but when the baptism of the Holy Ghost got a hold of me, and I want to tell you this, I was a terrible student. I almost flunked out of high school. And uh, one of the things that happened was that I, because of a physical illness, I had to leave high school for six months. And as a result, all my studies got all, all upside down. And when I was in grammar school, words were spoken to me. In elementary school, our words were spoken to me by a teacher that said, oh, you'll never learn this. And you know, there, you know this, there is power of life and death in the tongue. And I believed what was said. And so those, those days were really very fuzzy to me. Uh, and I didn't care about school. I, I couldn't learn anyhow. And, but something happened to me at 15. I was baptized in the Holy Ghost in Brooklyn, New York at 5 o'clock in the morning all by myself. Didn't know that that's what happened. But out of a desperate illness... I awoke, the Lord gave me a dream, I won't go into all of that, it's in my book, The Delight of Being His Daughter, but basically for about two hours in January 1954, wave upon wave upon wave, as I was in the living room of that tiny railroad apartment in Brooklyn, all by myself, wave upon wave of the Father's love, the Father's love, the Father's love, just saturated me, and in three weeks, I became transformed in personality. My body was definitely touched, changed, 
and my mind, it was like the cobwebs were taken off of my brain, and my average went from a 72 to a 94. Now, and it's for that reason that I went into education, and I was an elementary school teacher and a, a middle school teacher because I have a passion that our kids know that when the Holy Ghost gets a hold of you, he touches you body, mind, soul, and spirit. And there is no such thing as a poor memory. Scientifically, ladies, there is no such thing as a poor memory, except for biological or chemical reasons, but untrained undisciplined memories abound we do not use that I hope you heard what uh, sister Fuchsia was saying this morning concerning certain cultures where there is discipline we do not have the discipline in this culture the the Asian culture is so disciplined to learn and I just say father if we are going to be women of strength and dignity you're going to give us a baptism that will not only make us feel good but transform us and motivate us to be lovers of the truth lovers of your presence and lovers of our families let me give you four A's for emotional health there are four A's that must be solidly done in your family. And the first A is your children, your grandchildren need your attention. Huh? They need attention. Oh, God. My kids are my priority. I am really busy, but up to this day, they're the only ones. Can you get into your mom and dad in the office? The only ones that can get right into our office. They'll just call and they'll say, hi, it's me. <laughs> and they can get in because they are our priority. Even, even as adults, they are. And now my grandsons are. I have both my grandsons in nursery school right, right in where we live. My daughter is part of our staff three, hour, three days a week, and we have our own in-house staff. We drive the staff crazy. I'm down there all the time checking, is this right? You got all the doors locked here. Now, when did he last eat? Is his diaper dry? You know, they go, oh, no. Did we have to have these kids here? At any rate, the attention is absolutely vital. And then the other thing is affection. I am asking that the Holy Spirit so invade our lives that we would be warm, that we would be compassionate, that we would know how to be affectionate. And I can easily say this, my husband's story is written in a heart after God on the life of David. My husband came, uh, he's written about it so I can say it publicly. He came out of an alcoholic abusive background. Any of you know anything about coming out of abusive alcoholic backgrounds? And uh, when we were married, I was convinced that this marriage was made in heaven. We were God's answer to the kingdom. Well, we almost killed ourselves the first year. I had no idea what a dry alcoholic was like. Uh, even though he was converted, there were deep holes in his soul. And his study of the life of David brought him into depths of healing. I, I watched over the years. But one of the things was that my husband grew up in a home where he never heard, I love you. His parents grew up in a home where they never heard, I love you. And so one of the things that was my task in life was to teach my precious man of God how to say, I love you. And I will say this, the Lord gives interesting keys. I kept saying, well, do you love me? And he'd say, well, of course I love you. And I said, well, why don't you tell me? And he'd say, well, you know I do. And I said to the Lord, Lord, how do I teach him to verbalize? And I tell you what, the Lord will give you keys. And I would slip my arms around him and say, I am so glad I, that, I'm so glad you love me. And he said, oh, yes, I love you. 
And then all of a sudden he got used to saying it. And now he says it all the time. He called us and he said, I love you and Jenny, I just love you. Our kids need to be taught that we love them and they need to say how I love you. And I, I want to encourage you that we give the ones that we love and in our church that we raise up people who know what it is to give attention, who know what it is to give affection, who are expressive. The Holy Ghost, when he comes into our lives, opens up a whole dimension. He heals us emotionally and allows us to reach out. The other A is affirmation. Oh God, help me to use my mouth to be a Holy Ghost encourager. Let me give affirmation. Let me say thank you. Let me be able to do, just be able to strengthen those positive qualities in my children. You know, I'm so glad all the things that I learned, I'm more prepared to be a mother now than I was 36 years ago, right? And uh, now my, my grandson's becoming the recipient of all of this. I mean, I just love to hold him and dance and say, I love you, a bushel and a peck, a bushel and a peck, and a hug around the neck and a barrel. Am I dating myself? Yes, how many of you know that? <laughs> Whenever I share that, people say, you were dating yourself, but he gets kisses, 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 and now, he gives us kisses, goes mm -hmm. We teach those around us how to love by the expression of our own love, to give attention and to give affection, to give affirmation. And then there's a last A that is so important and for our churches as well as for our homes, and that is a sense of affiliation. A sense of affiliation. You know what it means with a sense of affiliation? Well, yeah, what is it? Belonging. You know why kids join gangs? They want to belong someplace. And I want to encourage you to wrap your arms around. I do this around our kids in church. I have a passion for our kids in church. When I look at them, I want to pat them on their head. I want to I wanna get to know them. I'll, some of the little girls, when they come out of Sunday school, I'll say, can I get a hug from you? And they'll sort of look at me, and I'll say, here I am. And they'll look, and then they'll run into my arms. And after that, I've won them. See, we've got to win the hearts of our kids. We got to tell our families, I'm so glad you belong to me. You belong to me and you belong to him. You belong to him. And we have people in some of our Sunday school classes that their whole function is just to be Holy Ghost greeters. They don't do anything else but greet these kids and say to these kids, we're so glad you're part of this class. We're so glad you're part of this fellowship. You're part of the body of Jesus Christ. Our kids need this sense of belonging. And you know who exemplifies that more than anything else? What was it that the father said to the son when the son was baptized? All four of these are included in that. What did he say? This is, what's the word? My, what is that? Affiliation, belonging. This is my, what? Beloved, what is that? Affection. This is my beloved son, what? In whom I am, well, what's that? Affirmation, huh? He got the Father's attention. And the son had the father's attention. And he said, this is my beloved son. Affection in whom I am well pleased. And he is the model parent. You know what, I want you to stand with me for a moment. And I, if you've never, if you're single, God is giving you children. I want you just, if you've never had children, you have nieces, nephews, you have children in your congregation. I want to open your hands. I have such a passion for this. I don't know what goes on in your homes, but I pray for such a baptism of the Holy Ghost and of love and of warmth and of peace. Father, I would speak over these precious women, whether they be single, whether they be married, whether they be young married, whatever season of life they are in, with children, without children, grandmothers, 
Father, I just would speak that we as women are called to be nurturers in the body of Jesus Christ. We are called, Lord, in a cold and a compassionless world to be an extension of your heart. So I release over these women an awakening of a nurturing anointing. Oh, Jesus, bless these homes. May these be homes be homes of peace and of joy, of harmony, Lord. I just speak, Lord, an anointing that will heal. Wherever there are wounds, we would say, my God, search our hearts, try us, see if there be anything within us that is broken, and then heal us. Give us such an outpouring of your love, Lord, that when we're in your presence, you just heal us and let our homes be homes of peace, joy, and laughter. Lord, I speak that over these precious women. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you say, yes, Lord? Yes, Lord. Oh, yes, you may be seated. And by the way, let me just also throw out, this is, I was not tending to go here. We're coming back to where I was. But I just sense such a yearning in this area. Uh, know, know how to be an example to your family of repenting. <laughs> My husband and I are both very strong individuals. We have very strong opinions. Is that true? Yes, Jenny, that's true. And if you have strong opinions, uh, there are times in which uh, iron rubs against iron, right? And when iron rubs against iron, what do you get? You get sparks, that's right. And uh, I would say that one of the biggest things we had to learn was how to ask for forgiveness because none of our homes is perfect. And you know, we've said a lot about the bride of Jesus Christ. The enemy can't touch that, but he can mar the picture on the earth. And the picture of the whole bridal paradigm is in families and is in husband and wife. And as the revelation of the bride of Christ increases, I'm sensing the warfare against marriages and families is increasing because this is the human illustration of this holy paradigm and my admonition to us is fight for your families. Fight for your relationships. Fight for your children. Fight for your grandchildren. And by God's grace, know how to be an example of saying, forgive me. I was wrong. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we've, we've managed to bring harmony into our home. Uh, we, we're too busy not to have harmony in the home. Uh, when, you, when you're really out there, you need some place that is replenishing. The kids need some place that are replenished. And, uh, but a few weeks ago, well, it was a couple of months ago now, time goes very quickly. But uh, my husband and I really had a difference of opinion. And this one, I was really mad at him. And uh, so uh, things got very silent. You know you can have a peaceful silence at home, and then you can have uh, an irritating silence, you know, where you sort of pass one another in the kitchen, and you just go about doing this thing, you know, and you, you know it's kind of tense, and uh, uh, he deserved it. Well, those were my thoughts, ladies. Those were my thoughts. And by the way, things begin in the thought life, right? That will either make us or break us. And our emotions follow the way we think. And, and I was beginning to focus in, in my thought life, of what he said and why he said it and what he should have said. And by the time you begin to do all of that, I was just getting uptight and uptight and more and more perturbed with him. And uh, he was bouncing off me, and uh, so there we were. And I went upstairs to have my quiet time and to dwell in the holy place, and he went into his office to have his quiet time and dwell in his holy place. How many of you have tried to have quiet time when you're at aught? It ain't gonna work. You know, my mind was just, and I'm sitting there thinking, oh, brother. And I said, I know what I have to do. Could I wait five minutes at least? <laughs> you know, it was kind of neat. Uh, this was really noteworthy. Uh, we went out, we went to one another at the same time. 
He came out of his office, I came out of my, and we sort of looked at one another. And he said, uh-uh, we're not going down that road. I said, that's right, my dear. I said, forgive me. And he said, okay, I will. I said, what do you mean you will? Did you not ask for forgiveness? Yeah, I mean, hey, you know. <laughs> but he knows how to trip my trigger, right? And, but actually there was a, a mutual, and you know what I said? I said, you know, it may have taken us a number of years to get here. I said, but may we learn how not to indulge in those kind of attitudes that will bring disharmony into our home. The baptism of the Holy Spirit must practically work in how we live, how we relate. Oh, and that doesn't mean that we are perfect. What it does mean is that there's a sensitivity in our heart and I have such a yearning. God, our homes are being attacked left and right. Our children are being torn in this culture. The church will arise with an anointing to be out in the streets and in the home and to be a powerful demonstration. Blessed are the peacemakers. Have you heard that? Blessed are the peacemakers. And I pray that there will be a peacemaking anointing that will be upon us. That where we go, where we walk, that we will leave peace and harmony behind us. That is something I'm sensing from the Lord in this hour. Nehemiah chapter 4, there's a mandate. That wall was built. And it was built with weapons of war and it was built with cement and the Lord said it's cement of my love and the call went out that this wall is not going to be completed unless it's built house by house family by family and then the word went out fight for your families house of Israel fight for your families and I pray that there will be that anointing. Turn with me. You got something in Isaiah? I, I mean, in, uh, we'll come back to Luke. We are really going to get there. But I want you to look with me to Isaiah 59. I mentioned this last night, and with this, I want to move into what I, I've been working on this message for months, and here I am not even in it yet. All right, Isaiah. In Isaiah 59, I want to give you a covenant promise. Those of you that are praying for children and some of our most effective intercessors are some of our singles we're seeing them begin to carry the burden uh, for some of the children in our generation and there is a promise how many of you are covenant parents and covenant grandparents i asked you that last night you know what it means to be a covenant parent and a covenant grandparent there is what does the word covenant mean there is a promise, a binding promise, and there is a promise the Lord has given to us. And if you look at Isaiah 59, verse 21, as, well, you know what? We have to go to verse 19. From the west, men will fear the name of the Lord. I'm Isaiah 59, verse 19. From the west, men will fear the name of the Lord, and from the rising of the sun, they will revere his glory. For he will come like a pent-up flood that the breath of the Lord drives along. Can you visualize this? This is quite a revival promise. From the west, men will fear the name of the Lord. From the rising of the sun, they will revere his glory. And how he's going to come? He will come like a pent-up flood. I want you to see it. Holy Ghost, see it. It's like a dam that's been built. And there's water. It's a pent-up it's pent up water. And I would say the intercessions have been sown into the heavenlies. And the heavens are becoming heavy with the water and with the dew of the cries and the intercessions of God's people. And he's about to burst forth as a pent up flood. I oh, see it in the spirit. And he says, for he will come like a pent up flood that the breath of the Lord drives along. It is the wind of the Holy Ghost. And I believe that one of the things you, we hear about is concerning even the bowls of the Lord from Isaiah, from Revelation chapter 5, that intercession, every one of your prayers are being held in a golden bowl, according to Revelation 5. You are sowing your prayers into the heavens. And even as the angel of the Lord came to Daniel, how long did Daniel pray? 21 days. And what did the angel of the Lord encounter 
in trying to get to answer these prayer. There was tremendous warfare in the heavens. And when there was finally a breakthrough, the angel of the Lord said, Daniel, from the first day that you prayed, your prayers were heard. But it's taken these 21 days to break through the spiritual conflict that was going on. There are some of you that need to hear, do not stop your intercessions. Do not, you persevere for your children, for your husbands, for your churches, do not stop. There is spiritual warfare that's going on, but your prayers are being held in a golden bowl full of incense. And at the proper time, the Holy Ghost says now, dump it back out. And I want you to see that these golden bowls are dumped out and it, the breath of the Lord, it's like all of a sudden this pent up flood, the breath of the Lord, the wind comes so strongly. And then the word is the redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. And here, look at verse 21. Oh, you put your teeth into this. As for me, this is my what? Covenant, covenant. Now you need to underline that. This is my covenant. Who gave this covenant promise? The Lord. And you put your feet firmly on that. This is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit who is on you. And my words that I have put in your mouth will not depart from your mouth or from the mouths of your children or from the mouths of their descendants from this time on and forever, says who? Says the Lord. And there is an implication. My spirit that is on you. What's the implication? That we are carriers of his spirit. My word that is where? In your mouth. The implication is the word. We are recipients of his anointing and recipients of his word. That as we partake, the Lord says, I got a covenant promise with you. This anointing is not going to depart from your kids or from your grandkids. It is my covenant promise. Stand with me. Stand with me. And I want you to take the hands of one or two other, three other people. And I want you to mention the names of your children, your grandchildren. Just go in little circles. Just go in little circles. And I want you to take a few moments and mention the names of your children and speak the covenant promise over them, over your churches, over the children in your congregation. Declare that the anointing shall not depart from your household and from your congregations. Oh, Father. Just take a few moments. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Father, we mention the names of these children. We mention the names of our grandchildren. We speak our congregations before you. The pastors and the leadership. Oh, pour out your spirit. Pour out your spirit. From one end of this country to the other. From the west to the east, to the north, to the south. And Lord, begin it in our homes. Begin with us, Lord. Begin with us. And now we stand upon your promise for our households that the Spirit of the Lord that is upon us, that your word that is within our own hearts will not depart from our children or our grandchildren. In 
Jesus' name, send forth the word and bring healing and deliverance and restoration and mark our seed for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. We praise you for that. We praise you for that. We praise you for that. We give you thanks, Lord. Oh, yes. Yes, Lord, we give you thanks. Bring the wayward one home, Lord. The prodigal shall come running. Yes, Lord. The bats of rebellion are broken. Thank you, Lord. Addictions are broken. Addictions are broken. In Jesus' name, the addictions are broken through the power of the blood and the authority of the name of Jesus. We release that anointing, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. And now, Father, upon my precious sisters, give an impartation of an intercessory heart that we might stand and fight for our families. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Can you give him a praise offering? Oh, hallelujah. Yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We praise you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You may be seated. And as you pray, what are the four things you're going to cultivate in your relationships? Huh? What are you going to give your kids, your grandkids? You're going to give them attention. You're going to look at them. You're going to listen to them. And you're going to give them affection. Hold them close to your heart. Hold them close to your heart. Lou Engels was with us for the march for the call to D.C., and I know two years ago when I was ministering out in Pasadena, he's got marvelous children, but I was observing the fact that it looked like one of his boys, he was losing them. And Lou is so intense. He's written the book, Redigging the Wells. He's got an awesome, oh my, I've never met anybody that fasts like he does. And he got up at the, uh, at, in our church a couple of weeks ago and his son, who was just turned 13, he had been 12, he, Lou got up and he said, uh, I almost lost the heart of my son two years ago. And I went to battle to win his heart. And his son, who just turned 13, just came off a 40-day juice fast with his father to pray for the youth in this nation. And I went, amen, Lou. You went after the heart of your child. And so we're going after the hearts of our children. Someone said to me, you know, you can lay down all the rules. You can dictate. And I was in a meeting, and we were laying some rules down, and I had a laugh because one of the brothers said, uh, okay, you have my vote, but not my heart. And, uh, and he, he was chuckling. And uh, I said, boy, have you put your finger on something? that we can at times get okay, but if we've lost the heart, and may God give Holy Ghost skill how to win the hearts of these children. This is the anointing, ladies, that in the last days God was gonna turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And the hearts, not the heads first, it's the hearts. And so as we give attention and we, as we give affection and as we give affirmation and a sense of affiliation, and the Lord then will give you creative Holy Ghost keys as to how to unlock those hearts, amen? And you stand on this covenant promise. Well, praise God. Turn back with me to Luke 24. <laughs> we got the eagle who's getting ready to soar. You know what? I, 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 just, I, I, I just believe there is going to be fruit from this because I, I, it's our homes. It's got to work in our homes. I watch us at conferences like this and I think, oh God. Oh, I have to tell you one other example. I was, I, I, I'll, I need to tell you how sometimes this works. A number of years ago, I, this was a classic example. I was at one of the most anointed conferences I had ever been. And oh my, 
I, it was just marvelous. I mean, people were mad. And, and I got into my car, and my two older girls, Jenny was much younger. There's my girls, they were 12 and 9 when precious Jenny came along. So there's a little age difference here. And so my girls were teenagers. And when I had left uh, the house that weekend, I said to my husband, uh, I told the girls the laundry room's a mess, and what I don't, I can't stand is is coming into messy things. I just, and so at any rate, I said, just make sure they get this all cleaned up, right? Well, I get into the car after this most anointed, uh, it was marvelous, and I'm driving in my little car, and I'm coming from Pennsylvania back to Maryland, and I'm so excited to get home because I knew that as soon as I walked in, my family would go, whoa, look at her. The anointing is all over her. Oh, I just knew I'd come just walking in here. And I don't know how this happens, but um, um, when I park the car to get into the house, I have to go through the door where the laundry room is, right? And uh, so I'm praising the Lord, and, but trying to get the door open. And I can't quite get the door open. And uh, I'm thinking, why can't I get this door open? And finally I push it. Well, if it was a mess when I left, it was just a mess. And I don't know what happened, but all of a sudden I went, Laura, Diana, get down here right now. And, and they came, and my oldest daughter is six foot, bare feet, right? And even as a teenager, and they came down, and I said, what is this? What is that? Did I tell you to clean up? And I went off. And my oldest daughter stood to her full six feet, put her hand on her hip, and said, my, you must have had a wonderful weekend. <laughs> and I went, I did. I really did. Oh my goodness, I really did. You were supposed to see the glory. And well, they didn't see the glory. I don't know how that, how did I get, I, well, I had to go upstairs, get myself back in order. And how many of you know that often revelation exceeds experience, right? And, and you can have this revelation and rejoice in it, but it hasn't quite yet been worked into the fiber of your being. And so, lo and behold, I had to come down and say, would you forgive me? That was a raunchy attitude. And my girls went, uh-huh. <laughs> and I said, okay, could you explain to me? And well, what happened was their father had a whole agenda for them. And they were working their heads off for their father. I didn't even give them an, an opportunity to explain. But you know what? It never left me. That experience never left me. And the girls still remember it. And you know what they remember? Not so much that I lost my cool, but that I came back and asked for forgiveness. And that, rather than pull us apart, right, that bonded us all the more. And I say that because often when we come together in conferences, you're going to be going back home. I don't know what kind of situations you're going back to, but I tell you what, the Lord has had us in wonderful places. And we need to realize, Father, our bodies are getting a little weary in the process. And so when I get home, give me wisdom that I can be just a real person and that, that, Lord, I can just be a demonstrator of this. Now, let me give you my passion, my other passion. I have a lot of passions. I'm a passionate person. And I pray you live that way, right? I told you my experience with caring for all of my elderly and I didn't get, I didn't get all into that, but July and August were horrendous for me. I watched my aunt die by inches. I have been in and out of nursing homes for the past 12 years. I have had them living with me. I've had in every level of, of care. And, and sometimes I would go in and have to speak in tongues because I go in and I see what, you know, I thank God for Fuchsia. She shared this, so some of you have asked. Uh, Fuchsia's 80 years old. And, you know, as I, as I look at her, there are many in their 70s that are already in the nursing homes and, and I, uh, uh, forgotten. By the way, may our churches be alert to care for the widows and to care for those that are orphans and to go into those nursing homes, those nursing homes. I went, I have to, I, I'm running on my tangent again. But one time, it was so hard for me to go into this nursing home. I would groan because I was watching my aunt just lose it day after day, and I didn't want to be there, and I didn't like the smells, and I didn't like all the things I was watching, and I got pulled into the nursing home, put my head on the steering wheel, and I said, God, give me grace. 
please let me make a difference. Let me take the anointing I feel in these meetings. Let me take it into the nursing home because that's where it's important. So I went, not full of faith. I went, but I had asked. And as I walked into the nursing home, I heard one of the ladies playing when a, some, a volunteer came in and she was playing some hymns. And uh, nobody was singing and it was sort of draggy. And I, and I walked in and I said to her, uh, let me sing with you. I said, do you know how great thou art? And she said, yes. Now, I have a loud voice. And I felt God's anointing come on me in that nursing home. And I began to sing, oh, Lord, my God, how great thou art. And within a few moments, these shuffling feet, they come out of the rooms. They came into the, you know what? I will never forget that. And I sang it again. And even the nurses came out of the nurse's station. You know, oh, Lord, my God, then sings my soul. And all I did was go from patient to patient, just touch them. They didn't know I was praying for them. I just touched them. And I thought, oh, God. And when I watched my aunt go by inches, do you know that I had to command her to leave? Her body was, we were just at feeding tube stage. And I said, Lord, I don't want to go that way. And once I was really assured that her spirit was ready, my daughter said to me the night before she died, and that was just a few weeks ago, my middle daughter said to me, Mom, we gotta go. I just know we gotta go. And I said, Diane, I'm so tired. She said, Mom, we gotta go. And she, we got in the car at quarter to nine at night and went into the nursing home. And I leaned over to her and I thought, oh, this is an excruciating process. And I said, Father, show me. And I just sensed the Lord say, speak release to her. And I leaned over to her. I said, Tanana, this is your daddy speaking to you again. I said, and I'm telling you, you can go. Jesus is waiting to receive you. You can go, Tana Anna. We are fine. And I'm going to see you on the other side because he's waiting for you. And the next morning, she was gone. And I left from that. And I lifted my hands with my heart. Oh, I mean, that lady's been in my life my whole life. And I said, Father, thank you for the gift of life. And I challenge you, as I said last night, choose life every day that you live. I don't care how you feel. We all at times feel like getting out of one side of the bed into the other side. I mean, there are times you which you think, you know, uh, you know, good morning, Lord, or good Lord morning. I mean, you, we, we all, you know, we, I, I know what that's like, but I tell you there's power of choice. I heard, I heard Fuchsia say that. We must choose life. Deuteronomy says, I have placed life and death before you, the blessing and the curse. Choose life. Choose life. Choose life in your attitude. When you're tempted to think negatively, just say, oh God, I'm going to gird up the loins of my mind and I'm not going down that direction. I am going to choose life. Well, one of the ways in which you do that, and ladies, I'm asking you for another commitment. I just am praying that God will raise up women of the word, women of the anointing and women of the word. I'm going to read something to you that I wrote in the Amplified that is really important. The Amplified says concerning the word, if any man has ears to hear, let him be listening and perceive and comprehend. Be careful what you are hearing. The measure of thought and study you give to the truth you hear will be the measure of virtue and knowledge that comes back to you and more besides will be given to you who hear. That's Mark chapter 4, 22 and 23. Mark 4, 22 and 23. And I want to encourage you to read that scripture. It follows the parable of the sower and the seed. And again and again, Jesus says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church. And in this case, he says, if any man has ears to hear, let him be listening, 
How many listeners do we have? Oh God, let him be listening, perceive and comprehend. And he said to them, be careful what you are hearing. And this is what I want you to just focus in on. The measure of thought and study you give to the truth you hear will be the measure of virtue and knowledge that comes back to you and more besides will be given to you who hear. You know what that means? Don't let the word go in one ear and out the other. Don't let it go into one eyeball and out the other. We are to be meditators in the word of the Lord. Now look with me to Luke chapter 24, and I'll never get this done, but that's okay. Here we are. I want you to look at verse 25. You know, Jesus is talking to his disciples on the road to Emmaus. And uh, by the way, there's something that you learn of the nature of the Lord. I don't know, when I was filled with the Holy Ghost back in January 54, he put a desire in my heart that has never stopped. I want to know his ways. I want to know his ways. You know, Moses said that. Teach me your ways and show me your glory. And I'm not just content to know about him. I want to know his ways. And his ways are really funny. I mean, if you, if you study the Gospels, he does some unusual things. By the way, I was just doing a study not only of tears, but of the size of the Lord. And if you read the Gospels, there are numbers of times when people come from he for healing that it's recorded and with a sigh, he reached out and he healed them. I had never seen that before. You know what it's like? Someone comes to be healed and in the, in the Greek, it, it's like he goes, <sighs> you know what's carried in that sigh? That, that word carries both anger and grief, angry that sin would have so devastated this creation and almost a grief that, that these things would be so, see, because it was never meant to be that way, never meant to be that way. And, and you just feel his heart as he goes, <sighs> it was never meant, we were never to be a broken distorted creation. Well, at any rate, part of his ways are manifested. He, uh, you almost have to see this. Let's, let's go to verse 17 of Luke 24. The uh, two disciples are on the road to Emmaus. And that is really neat, right? I don't know what they're going to Emmaus about. That's in the opposite direction of Jerusalem. They got word that Jesus was raised from the dead. And it's almost like they shrugged their shoulders and they said, oh yeah, sure. Let's go to Emmaus. I mean, let's just get away from all of this. That's literally, they're going in the opposite direction. And, and why Jesus chose to be with the ones he was, uh, he, in verse 15 it says, and as they talked and discussed these things of what had just all happened and walked along with them, uh, Jesus walked alongside of them. And look at verse 17. And he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? Now, how does that strike you? Don't you think that's funny? You know what he's saying to them? What are you talking about? I want you to know that one of the ways of the Lord is that he loves to ask questions. You know, and I thought, you know, this is, he just was resurrected from the dead. And he's walking along with these two disciples and he has this kind of patience. You know what really gets to me? I was standing in Northern, we used to minister in Northern Minnesota in a camp in Northern Minnesota. It was wonderful. We had uh, five to 800 people and outhouses and no showers. Wonderful, wonderful. You talk about endurance and developing hardiness. I mean, my goodness, and using lots of deodorant and spray. I mean, that was, but then the mosquitoes got you if you used too much of that, right? So, but you know what? They were awesome times. They were also, I meet people from all over the place that were up in Camp Dominion and I would cook. That, by the way, that's where I learned most of my spiritual lessons. We used to be in the restaurant business, as well as the apartment house business, at the same time that we were full-time in ministry. Don't ask me how we did all of that. But I know how to cook for 500 people. And I used to cook at camp. Some of my richest lessons in the Lord were learned in that rugged kitchen. 
and sometimes we would finish and, and we washed in Clorox. I mean, what we all did, I mean, my goodness, bless God. <laughs> we only had, we only got sick one summer out of all the summers, 20 summers we worked there. We, we didn't have dishwashers, nothing, and we fed, oh my goodness. Well, at any rate, one day, uh, one night I came exhausted into the tabernacle and oh, the praise that filled that place. And I just stood against the back and just soaked in the praise and the worship and the Lord spoke to me and he said tell my people I love to cook breakfast for them <laughs> you know what I still remember where I stood and I went <laughs> and all of a sudden John 21 became alive to me and the Lord said tell them I love to cook breakfast for them how many of you know that when Elijah went into a depression, do you know what the Lord did? He went to him and said, would you get up and get going? He cooked breakfast for Elijah. He said, Elijah, come on, get up and eat. And you know what he did in John 21? The disciples are so beside themselves. And you know, when things get all confusing, you like to go back to the familiar. And the familiar was gone back to fishing. And I'm sure Peter led them and said, let's go back fishing. And they went back fishing. And Jesus stands on the shore, has a charcoal fire, and he's broiling fish. And he says, lads, did you catch anything? No. Why don't you put it over on the other side? Who's this guy? All right. And all the fish came. And John says, it's the Lord. And Peter jumps out of the boat. And as he gets to the shore, you know what the last thing he wanted to see was? A charcoal fire. What had just happened around a charcoal fire, ladies? He had denied his God three times. And the Lord knew how to heal. He knows how to heal. This was a healing memory. And what does the Lord do? He cooks breakfast. He says, come on, guys, eat. You're hungry. Come on, let's eat. And you know, such a revelation of his heart came to me. And I said, you know, you're really amazing. Lord, sometimes it's a little strange the way you move. I mean, if I were you, I would have reacted one of two ways. The destiny of the world is hinged on these 12. Oy vey, that this even happened. And, and they're out fishing when you have just been resurrected. I mean, if that were me, I'd go right out there. Say, you guys get in here right now. Did I put three years in you for nothing? Well, I said, okay, say you didn't do that. At least I would have put my face in the sand and interceded. Oh God, move upon them. You know, give them repentance. Let them see the urgency of this hour. You know what I sense the Lord say? He said, that's a big difference between you and me. And I said, but Lord, you cooked breakfast for them in the most strategic hour. And I stood in the back of that tabernacle and I cried with a fresh revelation of the beauty of our God, whose ways are not our ways, who is just so gracious. And he's walking with these disciples on the road to Emmaus. And they, and by the way, you have to see this because he's asking what they talked about. And I'm, we're almost ending here because I'm really tired, but you, some of you are too, I can tell that. But at any rate, hang in with me just for a few moments yet. It says, they stood still, their faces, downcast why were they downcast and despairing no you got to dig a little bit ladies if you catch this had they heard he was alive yeah they had yeah if you read the account they had heard he was alive why were they downcast they were believing a lie and the emotions follow your belief system say it with me the emotions follow the belief system 
They believed he was dead and as a result were depressed, depressed and despondent and in despair. The enemy lies to us in our minds and our emotions will follow what we believe. They believed he was dead and therefore their emotions followed their belief system. That's why we need to be renewed in our mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God, make us lovers of truth. We, I, 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 we could just really park on this, but I pray that that will take hold of you and you'll think about it. Look at your belief systems. What are you believing? When your emotions are following, when you feel depressed and feel despondent, if there be not a chemical imbalance, because that is also something that needs to be dealt with, but are normally the, the normal depressions and despondency, see what you're believing. Nobody cares. This situation will never change. There, and what you begin to believe and confess, your emotions follow that, right? And so one of them, called Cleopas in verse 18 asked him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem and you do not know the things that have happened there in these days? And what does Jesus say? He's so funny. What things? I went, ah, if anybody knew what things, you knew. What was he doing? Why was he going through this with them? This is a key if you're counseling. Why did he ask him these questions? Because Unless you and I have an opportunity to express at times the turmoil and the anguish. And you know what I found? That one of the keys for being a counselor is knowing how to write, ask the questions. Before they could hear, they had to get out all their turmoil and all their confusion. And he's just saying, come on, tell me, come on, tell me. During the most devastating time of my life, back in 1981, when I felt my life was in, finished and everything else around me was finished, morning after morning, the Lord took me on my carpet and I poured out my soul. I remember those days, I have shared them. They were turning points. I remember I was so angry. I was so angry that I said to the Lord, if David can pray it, I can pray it. Rip their teeth out, slam them against the rocks. <laughs> Aren't you embarrassed to read some of those Psalms? I mean, you think, David. You know, and then you're told it's a new dispensation. You know, it's not a new dispensation. You know what? David knew how to pour his soul out to the Lord. His joys, his anguish, his depressions. He knew the power of transparency, not stuffing it down, not denying it. When you're hurt, most of us tell other people and they can't handle it, but he can handle it. He can handle it. And I tell you what, I said to the Lord, your word says your name is wonderful counselor. I said, now it's time. I need a wonderful counselor. And morning after morning, I poured out my heart. See, before we can hear him, when there's hurt, when there's been woundedness, we need to be able to pour out our heart. And so he says to them, what things? If anybody knew what things, he knew. But they needed to talk to him. And they tell him all about what was going on. And in verse 21, and we're going to move quickly to this end part, but they said after all of this, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. I know it's, I know it's a, a, an afternoon. Are you sharp enough to follow me in this? Were they wrong in what they hoped? No, no they weren't. Were they? He, they said, but we had hoped he would be the redeemer of Israel. Where were they wrong? How did they err? All right. They erred in how they interpreted he would be the redeemer of Israel. Now hear me, many times we get promises from the Lord and we are very quick to sort of figure out how that promise is going to be fulfilled. Well, I got this prophetic word, I got this promise, therefore that means A, B, C. And the Lord says, you got B all wrong. I'm not going B. We had hoped he would be redeemer of Israel. Were they wrong? No, he was. But what they had expected was Rome would be thrown off. They thought of an earthly kingdom. His was an entirely different kingdom. And so they continue to pour out before him. 
and, and then they tell of the resurrection, and look at verse 25, and I sense the Lord saying that to his church. He says, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to do what? To believe all that the prophets have spoken. Say, believe all that the prophets have spoken. God, help us believe what the prophets have spoken. To believe. And then he says in verse 26, Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then to enter his glory? What is the most important word in that statement? What word did they stumble over? Suffer. And so do we. We create theologies to eliminate suffering. No. Oh. They stumbled over the suffering. He's king, we're overcomers, but there's a valley of tears sometimes that needs to be walked through in that process. So oh, that's a whole other area. But here, now verse 27, doesn't this make your tongue hang out? Charles and I, my husband and I were traveling together and I said to him, Charles, this scripture makes my tongue hang out. And as we were driving in the car, I said to them, listen to this. I said, listen to this. And beginning with Moses, and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. <laughs> Don't you wish we knew what he said? So I said that to my husband. I said, look what it says. I said, why isn't, there, why isn't that written out for us? It says, beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them everything, everything that was written about himself. In the scripture, what did he say? So I said to Charles, sweetheart, what did he tell them? And he says, I have a few ideas. And as a result of that conversation, Every Tuesday night at Emmanuel's, we are doing from Genesis to Malachi, looking for all of the passages that speak concerning Jesus Christ. And it is amazing what we are uncovering. Do you know what? When you begin to see the scriptures breathed upon them, you're not going to have to try to have faith. Something Something is, you just look and you think, oh, he really said it. And he said it so many years before it happened. He is a God who has a plan of salvation from Genesis 1 right through to the end of Revelation. And the revelation of himself is overwhelming in it. And then this is the last, here are your wings. You can jump right over with me to verse 44. And with this we're concluding. And you will let me run out. I will bless you, but I'm going to run out because I leave for Alaska tomorrow. And I'm speaking at the Bible school in the morning, and I have to pack. <laughs> so glory, we're going to run right out. So I'm under more of a time constraint here. Okay, look at verse 44. And Jesus said to them, now he's with his disciples, and he said, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And I challenge you, women of God, do you know what is written about him in the law, in the prophets, in the Psalms? When you begin to see the revelation of Jesus Christ in that old covenant, you will worship him. And so he unfolds this, and then in verse 45, this is what he does. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Say it with me. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. I want you to stand with me. We're going to sit down one more time. I got one more point, but right now stand with me. I really, I know some of you didn't know, is she saying sit down, get up? What is she saying? I want you to make a transaction. I want you to put your hand upon your mind. Our teacher is with us. As Sister Fuchsia so loves to speak of him. Jesus, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we now are asking, you did it for your disciples. Do it now for us. Why don't you say with me, Lord Jesus, open my mind that I may understand the scripture. In Jesus' name. Father, I seal that right now over these women. 
I'm asking now that as they open that word, that the teacher, the Holy Ghost, would breathe upon that word and you would open their minds to understand the scripture. They will know the truth and in knowing the truth, they will be set free. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. You may remain standing because I can close this with you. This is the one wing. Go do your wing, you got one wing, but you can't saw with one wing. The one wing is the truth, is being f just being equipped with the scripture. And then Jesus says in verse 49, I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. They that worship him will worship him in spirit and in truth. And by God's grace, we will be women of the spirit and women of the truth. Can you soar with both wings? Oh, let's soar. Yes, Father, here we are. Women, give us, make us lovers for the truth. And Lord, fill us now, clothe us with the Holy Ghost and with the power of your presence. Give us a fresh anointing. Oh my God, may we soar like eagles into the heavenlies and may we soar with the wing of the spirit of the anointing with the power of God and then with the truth oh we thank you and now women uh, now our Lord I just speak your blessing over each woman in this room oh have you raised up a beautiful group of people and Father, I ask you, in your awesome mercy, release a choice anointing and let these women be women who in their daily life go beyond obedience, who don't do just what is required, but who will love you so intimately, so deeply, that they themselves will come up with creative ways to bless your heart just because you're who you are. So I speak now your blessing, your peace, your refreshment upon these, your daughters, in Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. You're awesome, God, you're awesome.